everybody. Uh, today we have a morning session, uh. three talks, three very interesting talks. And uh, as you know, uh, this afternoon there are no talks. And what is even more important, there is no common lunch this uh, today. But instead, we have a conference dinner on board of uh, uh, Danube ship. And uh, all the information how to get to the harbor and how to embark on the ship. We will be explained by Zoltan after the talks. So I call the first speaker, who is Dr. Adai from Oxford, and he is going to talk about the ABS Mirasoro Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to this beautiful place. Um, I haven't been to an integrability conference for a long time. I think the pandemic and not working on the field had that effect, but now I am touching again with some of my origins at integrability. Um, so today, the talk of today will be about conformal field theory techniques to study string scattering amplitudes on anti -deceiter. There are many uh, reasons why you would like to study scattering amplitudes. As physicists, the main reason should be that they are the observables that allow to test the predictions of your theory. But in a more abstract way, sometimes we can learn things from amplitudes that we cannot see just from, let's say, the Lagrangian of a theory. And over the last years, we have seen that there has been um, a lot of beautiful developments regarding uh, scattering amplitudes, especially in flat space. Today, what we will do, we will study scattering amplitudes of a string theory in curved backgrounds, and more precisely, graviton scattering amplitudes in a string theory on EDS. And please stop me at any time if you have any questions, or you can ask me uh, at the end. So a scattering amplitude, in this case a four-point scattering amplitude, is basically the probability that two particles colliding with momenta P1 and P2 result into two other particles with momenta P3 and P4. The amplitude depends on many things. It can depend, it will depend, on the parameters of your theory, here collectively denoted by G, it also depends on the kind of particles, the properties of the particles that you are scattering, for instance, their masses and polarizations, and also depends on the momenta of the particles being scattered, usually through uh, the Manderstam variables, S, T, and U. Let us recall uh, some uh, properties about the four-point graviton amplitude in a string theory, which is the, the object that we will study, and first in flat space, which is the known case. So the parameters of the theory, of course, are the string coupling constant Gs and alpha prime, and the amplitude depends on the polarization of the gravitons and the momenta of the four gravitons that you are scattering. It turns out that supersymmetry fixes uh, the polarization dependence of this amplitude. So once you know the amplitude for a given polarization, you know it for all other polarizations. And more specifically, if you have the amplitude like this as a function of the momenta and the polarizations, this is equal to some fixed quadratic prefactor, which I am not writing, but is very well known, times a function of the Manderstam variables S, T, and U. Okay? So this is the structure of four-point graviton amplitude in, uh, in a string theory, in flat space. Now, the computation, furthermore, in a string theory, organizes in a genus expansion, so you can expand this in powers of the string coupling constant, and the first term corresponds to the three-level amplitude, then we have the genus 1 amplitude, genus 2 amplitude, and so on. Okay? 
This one uh, is the one that we will look at. It's the simplest one. It's the only one, even in flat space, known in an explicit closed form. And at three level, and in flat space, we get the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude, which is this beautiful expression, symmetric expression of the three Manderstam variables, S, T, and U, and also uh, a function of alpha prime. This amplitude uh, has many very beautiful properties, so, some of them obvious, some of them not so obvious. So first, notice that the amplitude is crossing symmetric, so it depends on S, T, and U in a symmetric way. Here, S plus T plus U is equal to zero. Sorry, I didn't write that. Then, notice that it also has poles because gamma functions has poles at negative integers. Um, and gamma zero is also divergent. So it has poles due to the exchange of particles of mass to a square root of an integer over alpha prime. And at each pole, uh, the amplitude behaves like what I am writing here, with some polynomial, which, the, which is basically the polynomial that enters in the conformal partial wave of this amplitude. In addition, it has uh, a regular behavior. If you take the limit of very large s, keeping t fixed, you obtain this power law behavior in s, and also something that it, is, it will be very important for us, one can take this amplitude and expand it just using Mathematica, expand it in powers of alpha prime. And if you do this, you first obtain uh, the supergravity answer, which is uh, 1 over STU, plus a tower of alpha prime corrections, which are polynomials, symmetric polynomials, of uh, higher and higher degree in S, T, and U. These polynomials are always homogeneous because of dimensional uh, analysis, basically. And this, this is the answer. Something that is important to mention is that although each of these three properties is uh, kind of, or four, if you put crossing symmetry, is obvious from the answer, it is not clear how they connect to each other. Okay? So for instance, if you have the polynomial, this alpha prime expansion, it's not at all clear that this whole expansion will have this regular behavior, right? Because if you truncate this at any order in alpha prime, this regular behavior will be violated. And also from this expansion, uh, this, the presence of these poles will, will not be clear. So although each of these uh, conditions is clear from the answer, it is not so clear how to get one from the other. And, and that's why Veneziano, people like Veneziano and Virasoro and Shapiro are so famous, because it's not so easy to come up with a formula with all these four properties. Okay? Good. So the question we want to answer is what can we say about the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude on anti de Sitter space? So we want to extend this formula to, to ADS. So I will do this in two steps. First, we will define it in the first part of uh, in the next 10 minutes of the talk, and then we will try to study properties about it. I is that okay? Any questions so far? Or are questions at the end usually? Or I, I, I don't mind, but if anyone has questions. Okay, good. So, of course, um, as soon as we say ADS, we, we think of ADS-CFT duality. And the ADS-CFT duality helps us uh, in order to define a scattering amplitude on anti de Sitter. anti de Sitter is like a box. It has boundaries. So one cannot uh, use a textbook definition of a scattering amplitude because we cannot really define asymptotic states. So what the ADS-CFT duality tells us is that the string amplitudes in the ADS bulk are mapped to correlators of local operators in the conformal field theory living at the boundary. And because we are interested in a four-point scattering amplitude, we will study a four-point uh, correlator at the boundary. 
Let's try to be uh, a bit more precise uh, about the, the correspondence. Th this is uh, well known to, to most of the audience, but le let me, let me uh, stop here. So first, we will study a string theory on ADS5 cross S5 uh, with some string coupling constant and the radius of ADS and, and S5 uh, denoted by R. And this theory, as we know, is dual to 4D n equals 4 super Yanni Mills living in the boundary with parameters G Yan Mills and um, N, the, the rank of the gauge group. The ADS EFT duality provides us with a dictionary between um, these parameters. So GS is proportional to 1 over N, and R squared over alpha prime is proportional to the square root of the TOF coupling constant. So, from this dictionary, we see that the genus expansion of the string amplitude on ADS 5 cross S5 maps to the 1 over n expansion um, for correlators in n equals 4 super Yanni Mills, while stringy corrections, which were given, remember, by an alpha prime expansion, are mapped to 1 over lambda corrections on the CFT side. On the other hand, we would like to uh, scatter gravitons. And in ADS CFT, always the graviton, which is associated to the metric, maps to the stress tensor. And in n equals 4 super Yanni Mills, it maps to the stress tensor multiplet that has a primary, which is this guy, which is a protected scalar of dimension 2 in the stress tensor multiplet. OK? So the graviton of ADS 5 cross S5 maps to a protected scalar operator of dimension 2 um, in n equals 4 super Yanni Mills. I will write it down very explicitly in a bit. In addition, but they will not be uh, very, very important for this talk, we also have all the calusa klein modes because we are compactifying a string theory on S5, and they map to a tower of scalar operators of dimension k denoted by OK. So we will take four gravitons, four O2s, and compute the correlator, uh, the four-point correlator of this O2, 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 and we will compute it in a 1 over n and 1 over lambda expansion, because that is what corresponds to a genus expansion and to an alpha prime expansion on the string theory side. OK, so this is the quantity that we want to compute. Let's, um, two slides, I have to spend on, on what are the symmetries and the operators of, of n equals 4. It, it's not very tedious. So the symmetry is called PSU 2,2 slash 4, and it has a bosonic subgroup, which is given by SO2,4, which is the conformal symmetry group in four dimensions, cross SO6, which is... Um, the R symmetry group of, of n equals 4 in four dimensions. And the operator we are, going, we are going to consider is this operator OIJ, which lives in the symmetric traceless representation of SO6, of rank 2. This is simply trace of phi i phi j in a symmetric traceless way. Now, in order not to carry these indices around, so this i uh, runs from 1 to 6. These are the six scalar fields of n equals 4 super Yanni Mills. And in order not to carry around these two indices, i and j, it is customary to take this oi and j and take an L vector and contract these indices, i and j, with this uh, null vector. So the operator we will um, consider is this operator O2, which depends on a four-dimensional space-time point denoted by x, and also a null vector of six components denoted by y. OK? So the observable we are going to consider is four of these operators, x1, y1, etc., and this is the, the four-point function that, that we are going to consider. 
what can we say about it just based on symmetries? So first, we have bosonic symmetry. And uh, the bosonic symmetry implies, as you know very well from conformal symmetry, if you compute the four-point function up to a prefactor, which I wrote here, uh, this is just a function of the two invariant cross ratios, u and v, which are defined uh, by this. Something very similar happens uh, with the R symmetry factors, and you can construct two cross ratios that depend on R symmetry, and uh, this is a function of u, v, sigma, and tau. And the dependence on sigma and tau is quite simple. It is just a quadratic uh, a degree two polynomial in sigma and tau, while in u and v it can be a mess, and it will usually depend on n, the coupling constant, and, and that's, that's the hard bit. In addition, one has uh, supersymmetry, so we didn't say what, sup what were the constraints of supersymmetry, and these were worked out by Dolan and Osborne uh, some time ago, and the superconformal word identities imply two linear constraints uh, on, this, um, on, on this correlator, what I define. They are a bit complicated, but we, we will not deal with them explicitly. But there are some constraints of supersymmetry, uh, and I will tell them uh, what they are in a bit. Now, th this is a bit complicated, and, but it is what it is. It is not my fault. But it turns out that the right language to attack our problem <coughs> is, um, we, we will see in a second, sorry. So this, in general, is, as I was saying, is a complicated function of u and v, of n, the coupling constant, and, and also lambda. But what we will be interested in is in a 1 over n expansion of this object here. And genus zero amplitudes, uh, that is the one that we are interested in, correspond to the leading non-trivial term in a 1 over n expansion. So g has an expansion uh, like this I, as a function of, uh, of n, the rank of the group. And this object here is the object that we are going to be interested in, the piece that goes like 1 over n squared. If you drop all the 1 over lambda corrections, this corresponds to the, what is called the supergravity approximation of this holographic correlator, and that was computed by Aryutunov and Frolov 22 years ago. So this has been known for a very long time, uh, 22 years ago, but what we are interested here, so this is the analog of the 1 over STU in the, in the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude, but what we are interested in is in keeping all 1 over lambda corrections that come after these supergravity results. And this piece, the full piece proportional to 1 over n square, is what will be related to the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude on EDS. Is that okay? Great. So you have something which is a mess, you expand in powers of 1 over n. The first piece is trivial because it's just disconnected, and we will be talking about the second piece. The second piece is still a mess, but if you compute uh, 1 over lambda, if you, um, if you take lambda to infinity, and you are a to know and Frolov, they are extremely powerful, then you can compute this. And Well, they could 22 years ago. And, but we are interested in all 1 over lambda corrections as well. The right language, so let me tell you what the structure of this, but it turns out that the right language to study this is not the correlator in space-time, but rather to study this correlator in Melina space. And in Melina space, we go from a function of two cross ratios, u and v, to a function of three Melin variables, s, t, and u, with s plus t plus u equals to a constant, which here uh, is 4. And basically, um, the relation between these two things is given by this kind of Fourier transform. 
uh, is a Melin transform uh, where G UV is given by this. This is some prefactor that I am not writing. It's just some ratio of gamma functions. And, and this is the definition. And this object here is what we will call the string amplitude in ADS 5 cross S5. And the reason for that is twofold. First, remember that the amplitudes in flat space depend on three Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U. But these three Mandelstam variables look nothing like these two conformal cross ratios, U and B. Okay? So if we go to this language, now this amplitude depends on three mailing variables, S, T, and U, which are very similar to the Mandelstam variables of flat space. And the analogy is actually much stronger than that because this object, defined like this, has very similar properties to a usual scattering amplitude. And that's why the correlator itself is not the scattering amplitude, but the Mellin transform of the correlator is the scattering amplitude on, on ADS. So this function has uh, beautiful properties. So first of all, it is uh, crossing symmet symmetric in the three variables, S, T, and U. And second, exchange operators lead to simple poles of, um, of this form here. So this M has a pole in S equals the twist delta minus L of, of the exchange operator each time an operator is exchanged. Now, because we are talking about a conformal field theory and ADS, things are a bit harder. And these polynomials, they are called Mach polynomials, and they are more complicated than the conformal partial wave polynomials, but the formulas look very much the same. Okay. In addition, we have uh, the superconformal word identities. And notice that superconformal word identities in a space time they act with some differential operators here. And if you act with a differential operator here, then what happens is that basically differential operators in U and V shift the power U to the S minus 1, V to the T minus 1, etc. Okay? Then you can shift back the contour. And the idea is that supersymmetric word identities in space-time take the form of these difference equations in Melina space. So we get these difference equations where you get M evaluated at S plus 1, S minus 1, T plus 1, T minus 1, etc., with some uh, coefficients, and that has to be equal to 0. Okay? So there is a relation which is the analog of the supersymmetric word identities. And what is nice is that uh, Dolan and Osborne have solved for the particular case this word identity, and it turns out that M as a function of S, T, and these two are symmetry variables, takes the form of a shift operator acting on simply a function of uh, these smelling variables, S and T. Notice that this is very much analog to what happened in flat space. Okay? So in flat space, we said that the full amplitude as a function of the momenta and um, polarizations of the gravitons was equal to a prefactor times some function of the, of the Mandelstam variables. Here, very much the same. And this Mellin amplitude as a function of S, T, sigma, and tau is just some shift operator acting on this M as a function of only these two Mandelstam variables. Okay? So the, um, the situation is very much analog to what happens in flat space with some small details. So the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude in ADS then is this object that, uh, that I, I define here at leading non-trivial order in 1 over n. Okay? 
Any questions? So let, let me tell you what is the structure of it. It, 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 is, it seems very complicated, but, but it's actually much simpler than that. So first, um, let, let's try to, to give this M, S, and T from a diagrammatic perspective in, um, in a perturbation in 1 over lambda. You can actually compute it. You can actually compute this M of S and T by computing Witten diagrams in, in, um, in ADS. And it turns out that the supergravity computation corresponds to the exchange of supergravity fields and is simply a symmetric meromorphic function of S, T, and U. If you work in space-time, it is a mess. And people several years later noticed that when you wrote all this mess in Melina space, this mess in Melina space was simply 1 over S minus 2, T minus 2, U minus 2. And that's it. That's the supergravity answer uh, in Melina space. In addition, at each order in 1 over lambda, we have contact terms in, in um, Witten diagrams corresponding to contact terms. And it turns out that contact terms in Melina space, they are also very simple, and they are just polynomials in the variables S, T, and U. Okay? So, um, so basically, the tree amplitude then is equal to supergravity answer plus a 1 over lambda expansion. And at each order in 1 over lambda, we have a symmetric polynomial on the variables S, T, and U of higher and higher degree. So here we have degree 1, degree 0, sorry, degree 2, degree 3, and so on. A difference, uh, two things uh, to say, a difference with flat space is that now these polynomials are not homogeneous. So we have degree uh, 3, let's say, and also we have all the other lower degrees in ST and U. And furthermore, although we know that the answer are polynomials of higher and higher degree, we do not know, we don't know what the coefficients of these polynomials are. Okay? And basically, what we want to know and what would be the, the equivalent of knowing the, the Vira Soro Shapiro amplitude in ADS is to know or have one way of computing all these coefficients alpha, alpha 1, 0, gamma 0, 0, alpha 0, 1 in the 1 over lambda expansion. Is that okay? So, although this may seem like a very simple problem because once you have polynomials, that's it, one has, of course, an infinite number of polynomials and an infinite number of coefficients which we don't know. So the question is, how do we fix all these coefficients of all these polynomials? Is that okay? So what is known? So first, uh, le let's um, choose a basis to write these polynomials. So it is customary to introduce these two symmetric polynomials, a symmetric polynomial of degree 2 and degree 3, S squared plus T squared plus U squared, and STU. And remember that S plus T plus U is equal to 4. So all these are the independent polynomials. We have only two of them. And then with these two independent uh, structures, sigma 2 and sigma 3, we can construct all uh, polynomials. They will always be, we choose a basis of the form sigma 2 to some power a, sigma 3 to some power b. Okay? And then the coefficient in front of sigma 2 to the a, sigma 3 to the b, we expand in powers of 1 over lambda. So the first coefficient, we call it alpha, a, b. The second, we call beta, a, b, gamma, and so on. Is that OK? So this is the same notation uh, as the notation here, but this is the full expansion. OK? Uh, good. So we have the coefficient in front of sigma 2 to the a, sigma 3 to the b. It has some 1 over lambda dependence to this power. And then uh, we expand it in this way. So 
let me quickly uh, tell you what is known about these uh, stringy corrections and then what new things we compute or, or we can tell about them. So first, uh, there is a flat space limit that you can take. And indeed, if you are considering uh, strings on ADS5 cross S5, there should be a limit where the radius of this ADS is very large. And if the radius of ADS is extremely large, you are basically in flat space, right? In terms of Melin uh, variables, this limit corresponds to take S, T, U, and lambda very large with S, T, and U over a square root of lambda kept fixed. If you take this limit, then only the leading terms at each order in 1 over lambda survive. So they are the coefficients here. I call these alpha coefficients. So the expansion looks like this. And in this limit, we should recover the flat space answer, which is just the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude. So by taking the flat space limit, we can actually say what all these coefficients alpha are. So in this expansion, all these coefficients alpha are basically already appear in the flat space limit. And they are known because the flat space limit should give you the usual Virasoro Shapiro amplitude, while all these betas, etc., are truly ADS corrections to the Virasoro Shapiro uh, amplitude. Uh, now, by looking at the Virasoro Shapiro amplitude in ADS, we can, for instance, uh, read off that alpha 0 is on zeta 3, alpha 2 zeta 5 alpha 3, zeta 3 squared, etc. There is a beautiful structure of zeta functions that appears uh, in the answer. In addition, there are localization constraints. There was a poster uh, about this. And they give two further constraints at each order in 1 over lambda. They are quite a strong localization constraints for low orders in 1 over lambda. But of course, once you are to order 1 over lambda to the 20, and you have 50 coefficients, two relations are not too much. But th th they are quite strong at, uh, at low orders in 1 over lambda. Now, to be able to say a bit more uh, about these expansions, uh, we need to change our perspective on how we look at this amplitude uh, on ADS. And we need to go from a perturbative perspective to a non-perturbative perspective. And non-perturbatively, we know two things about the ADS Virasoro uh, Shapiro amplitude. First is that it should also satisfy a regge limit very much like a regge limit in flat space. So it should be bounded to order 1 over, uh, like, uh, one over S squared for a given range of t. Of course, this is not at all clear from the polynomial expansion. But the idea is that somehow, if you resum all these polynomial expansions, then the amplitude should have this behavior. The second, and this is an input from integrability, and, and this is why I am giving a talk here, is that we know that heavy string operators with dimension of order lambda to the one quarter are being exchanged. And this amplitude somehow should have these poles, right? Now, these heavy operators correspond to short strings, dual, for instance, to the Konishi operator, and have dimension of order lambda to the one quarter. And the question is, just from a polynomial expansion, can we see signs of these poles at these heavy operators? So, sorry? Uh, I don't listen very well. Oh, sorry. This is lambda to the minus one quarter. I apologize. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, as we will see in a second, these two properties, which seem very hard to understand from a polynomial expansion, are actually intimately connected. We can consider a toy model which corresponds to a uh, exchange to a partially, 
partially symmetrized exchange of a heavy operator, for instance, 1 over s minus delta, 1 over u minus delta, and remember that u is 4 minus s minus t. And this little toy model has two beautiful properties. So first, or three beautiful properties. First, it has poles when s is equal to delta, as we would like. Second, it has actually the correct behavior, because if you take the limit of s large, this goes like 1 over s squared. And third, the 1 over delta expansion results in polynomials, which is exactly the structure we see in a 1 over lambda expansion. So already this little toy model gives us an idea of how a polynomial expansion like this can resum into something with poles and with the right Regge behavior. Of course, in real life, we will have an infinite number of exchanges whose residue are these ugly Mac polynomials. And notice in particular that while crossing symmetry in S and U is automatic, in ST and U is not. So crossing symmetry, furthermore, will put constraints on the infinite exchanges that, that we can do. So the question is uh, how we can make this precise. The idea is to use Cauchy theorem. And, and uh, it seems uh, quite naive, and I think it is quite naive. So first, you write your Mellin amplitude, M3, as the following. And this is true by the Cauchy theorem, where the contour here is this little contour around S prime equals S. So we are integrating on S prime, and this is the contour. Then you blow up the contour, and you go to this figure. But remember that the Mellin amplitude has all these poles in all these heavy operators being exchanged. So that when you blow up the contour, you pick the contribution of all these poles. And in going from here to here, I have thrown away some contribution from infinity, and what justifies that is the Regge behavior that M decays with 1 over S squared. So after we do this, we end up with an expression where the three-level amplitude is given by the residues, uh, by a sum over residues of this object uh, here sum over these poles and these uh, crossing symmetric poles. And recall that we know what the structure of M around these poles is because M has this uh, structure here. So exchange operators lead to simple poles. So now we take this relation, and I am um, like hiding some subtleties in, in doing this, and basically, we expand now both sides in a 1 over lambda expansion. And this gives us a relation between the left-hand side, which are polynomials in the 1 over lambda expansion, and the CFT data of heavy operators on the right-hand side. So let me tell you uh, what happens when you do this. Uh, but this is the basic idea of these dispersive sums. So first, we have a look at this leading order coefficient, the coefficient that is some constant over lambda to the 3 halves. And quite beautifully, just that, plus the sum rules that arise from doing this exercise, imply that there should be a tower of operators labeled by some delta and with some spin whose dimension goes like lambda to the one quarter. So the lambda to the one quarter in the dimension of these operators is directly related to this lambda to the minus 3 half that we see here. And this is quite cool because it, it, is, it is exactly as, as expected. So we are in, in a good track. I don't know how much time we have. OK, five minutes. Um, so the general structure is that the twist of these operators, 
dimension minus a spin, will then have a one over lambda expansion, which I grow here, and the same for the OPE coefficients, they will have a la one over lambda expansion, and the leading order terms here and here will be related to the coefficients alpha AB, while the subleading terms will be related to the subleading coefficients beta, gamma, etc. And we get very precise equations relating the two uh, sets, so these alphas and betas, etc., to this uh, data here and here. But notice, because we are in an integrability conference, that this data, this data and this data, is CFT data of planar n equals 4 super n mills. So this is exactly what integrability computes, right? So this problem is the problem that integrability has claimed to solve a few years ago, right? And this is the problem that integrability people is working on now. So the, the upshot is that once integrability gives that to us, we can write the Vira Soro Shapiro amplitude on ideas. But there is more than this. So b before, so let me take two minutes to, to write something and then I will start telling what the final uh, results are. So j just for you to have an idea on the kind of equations that we get. <coughs> for instance, you can see um, th this is the sort of equation. So it's an infinite sum of these uh, structure constants, OP coefficients, divided this twist to the 4q plus 6, etc. And this has to be equal to alpha q0. Now, if you give me these OP coefficients and these taus, I could read off the alpha q0. But let me turn around the problem because we know this alpha q0 from uh, flat space. And this alpha q0 is simply the zeta function of 2q plus 3. And if we look at this expression and I expand this zeta function for large q, it turns out that the expansion of this for large q and the expansion of the left-hand side for large q allows me to read off the twist, the leading twist of these operators. And if we do that, we get exactly the answer than 20 few years ago, Gapser, Klebanov, and Polyakov got. So it is, I think, quite remarkable how the answer, how the spectrum at leading order arises uh, from this analysis of zeta functions. Uh, and this is what Gapser, Klebanov, and Polyakov already said. Now, l let me um, tell you uh, something more interesting. So the first point is that, as I already mentioned, all these alphas, betas, etc., follow from the CFT data given to us by integrability. But there is something more than this. Because I remember that I, to remember that I told you that crossing symmetry wasn't quite guaranteed for any exchange. So that crossing symmetry gives us further constraints on what the exchange should be. And these are constraints on the CFT data for instance, this equation here, and actually we get infinite constraints, which are not at all obvious from the integrability constraint. For, sorry, from the integrability perspective. So the equations also put some constraints on what the possible CFT data at the strong coupling is. And just to, uh, I, I have only two more, more slides, this and the next one. It turns out that the structure of these equations is quite rigid, and combining all these crossing constraints with the transcendental structure of n equals 4 super n mills seems quite powerful. And it is actually so powerful that in many cases it fixes the CFT data. And for instance, for the leading rigid trajectory, it tells us that the dimension of the leading rigid trajectory has to be exactly this, and the OP coefficients have to be exactly this. This result is a beautiful result, and it agrees exactly with the result of the strong coupling from integrability. But here we have derived from symmetries of, of, um, 
of the LDS with a sort of Shapiro amplitude. And the OP coefficients are a new result and are a prediction of uh, what we are doing. So let me conclude. So we have uh, computed explicit relation between the 1 over lambda expansion of the ADS with a sort of Shapiro amplitude and the planar CFT data of heavy operators. And this gives also non-trivial constraints on the CFT data, which are non-trivial from integrability. And the rigidity of the equations plus some mild assumptions lead to new results. This gives us a new connection between a standard bootstrap techniques and integrability. And computing the full ADS with a sort of Shapiro amplitude seems now doable. And I think it's the best way to package all the CFT data of short strings. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, for higher uh, states, uh, so I guess uh, there would be degeneracies, right? Yeah. The spectrum uh, would it, and normally, you know, in bootstrap, that's the main pain. Uh, absolutely. Uh, would that cause uh, problems for you as well? Right, right. Indeed. So the, in the, for the leading rigid trajectory, indeed, uh, we, we don't expect any degeneracy. Already for the next one, I, I, I personally do expect a degeneracy. Uh, it is not 100% clear, but indeed. And basically what will appear in this four-point function is some average, so some average of, of the anomalous dimensions, etc. However, one can do this program for more general correlators, and one could also uh, like unmix this. Yeah, but, but if you consider only this correlator, there will be the generacy for the higher rigid trajectory, for the subleading, etc. I think. So, and uh, also, what type of uh, further data from integrability would be useful? Say, if, uh, would, would you need this high well, trajectory data? Uh, well, what like, I, I think, for, for instance, at twist four, uh, so, so you, you have um, short operators of twist four, and, and uh, I think they are two of them. So, a weak coupling, there are four. I think two of them, uh, some of them stay and some of them go up. And the, the first question is if the two that go up, they go up to the same point or not. If they don't, it, we are lucky because there is no degeneracy. If they do, we are a bit less lucky. But it's kind of the dimension of these operators. And we do have a prediction for what the average is. Yeah. But so it's basically dimensions. But I think I would like to sit down and try to understand precisely which operators we are talking about. So sometimes at weak coupling and at a strong coupling, it's important to understand which operators you are talking about. And, and so we need to think what the precise intermediate operators in this correlator are. Yeah. But, but it should be just in planar n equals four super units. Hi, uh, thanks for the very nice uh, and clear talk. Um, what pre so since you mentioned uh, correlators of um, operators with uh, arbitrary or more generally external dimensions, what exactly prevents you from considering them? Since, um, as you know, with my collaborators, we worked on alpha prime corrections uh, for low orders, and we were able to determine these correlators uh, with more um, general external dimensions using information about the double trace spectrum. Now you're injecting right. new knowledge from integrability, right. uh, but what exactly prevents you uh, from considering these more general correlators? Yeah, nothing. It's just that, well, I mean, if you study, for instance, correlators like 2-2-PP, which I think would be the next frontier, mm -hmm. crossing symmetry is slightly less powerful uh, b because you, you have one crossing but not the other. So one would have to, uh, to understand how to, def how to deform these dispersive sun rules to non-fully symmetric correlators. Uh, and I think that would be the slight conceptual. But I don't think it's a problem. But, but, but this is the first generalization, is to try to work out these dispersive sun rules 
for correlators. Or we could maybe do PPPP uh, and then one has. Now for PPPP, you need to, um, you need to work out the, um, right, to solve the conformal word identities. Yes, they there will be some uh, SU4 structures. That, that's right, there will be the SU4 extractors that would be a bit more complicated. But, you know, this richness is what allows you to solve the mixing problem. Yes. So I don't expect any conceptual obstacles. But the mixing of operators, which uh, the previous question hinted at, is not a problem for uh, Oh, no, 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 it's, it's the opposite. So, yeah. um, so the, the point is that when you have mixing of operators, the operators have the same dimension at large lambda, but um, at lambda equals infinity. But uh, what happens is that if you study two different correlators, you will get two different yeah. averages. And from these two different averages, you will be able to solve what the dimensions are. Sure. So that would help you to solve this mixing, to, to, un to unmix. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So that, yeah. Okay. So my question has mostly been already asked, but uh, so may maybe I would uh, uh, like to ask or, or make a comment. Uh, the question would be, is it possible, is, is there any problem if these modes are very heavy? So if these operators are very, very large, like uh, 10 to infinity? Yeah, uh, so th th that's a, g a great question. So I think here, so one has to be careful with the order of limits of things. And, and uh, of course, if you take, so in this expansion, we are assuming that lambda is large, but the twist n so the n or delta that labels the twist is smaller than, than lambda. Of course, if you are in a regime where this scales with some power of lambda, then you will have to redo the analysis. Um, I, I must say that there are also operators with very large spin here, and, and, uh, and one expects that their anomalous dimension, as uh, worked out by people in the audience and people not in the audience, goes like a square root of lambda times log of the spin. So you can ask why you didn't consider these operators, and the answer is that their contribution is uh, exponentially suppressed. But actually, to connect to Marco's, uh, Marco's talk, there I would expect also non-perturbative corrections to all these 1 over lambda expansions, uh, and it would be very interesting to, to try to, to study this. Uh, well, integrability, yeah, and, and, and that's also something that would be very cool to, to, to understand. So although my perspective is non-perturbative, then we are solving things, uh, throwing away some exponentially suppressed corrections. Thank you. Absolutely, Although yes. Not in a closed form, but still. Yeah, and actually, yeah, that, that's, that's extremely interesting. Uh, so our after, our, after our paper appeared, there was this very interesting paper by Karen Huot and collaborators, and, and basically uh, he does, so what he does is numerical, but he starts from the other end uh, for, for a small lambda, and although, well, he, he, he can tell you himself. But for them, it is, although the problem in theory has been solved for all lambda, when actually one wants to apply this machinery to this problem, starting from a small lambda, you can get up to lambda equals 0 0.1. <laughs> and after that, it's very hard to go. So, but in practice, if you were powerful enough to do all this, one should match with, with what we are doing. So indeed, so, so th there has been also some progress in that direction, which I think is fascinating. 